once again. Thank you and uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to the panel discussion on the future of work, uh, finding mentors, sponsors, and uh, future work in women and finding mentors, sponsors, and allies. So our three panelists are uh, Kim, Brian, and Chris. And uh, I'd like to kick this off by introducing uh, Brian and, and Chris. So Brian and I actually met uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a different mentorship program where both of us were mentors. Uh, and that's how I met Brian recently. Brian is an ICF accredited coach and senior consultant uh, who's uh, more, uh, more than three decade career, spans business, technology, finance, and human development. He is a visionary connector, community builder, and a human development specialist. Uh, he loves to help people and teams unleash their human greatness so that they can create better together. Brian believes in each person's unique human greatness and in the power of harnessing this to amplify impact for teams, communities, and organizations. What a great fit for today's discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, you know, Brian is, among other things, uh, he's a presenting member of the Human First community and is continually learning how to be a better ally in advancing diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. Brian has served on the Washington DC Metro Area Chapter Board uh, for several culturally based national nonprofits uh, focused on greater inclusion, diversity, professional development, and leadership development. And it was in uh, one of these uh, uh, forums that I, Brian and I connected. Uh, Brian really, you know, he brings a lot of encouraging energy um, and has a relational and strategic approach uh, that uh, invites inclusive business leaders and teams he works with to expand their perspective, shift their mindset. Um, so we're really, really grateful to have you, uh, Brian, here with us today. Thank you for making the time. Uh, next up is Chris Sazdag, uh, who is joining us from the lovely Mauritius in Africa. Uh, I was just telling uh, Tiffany earlier, I always get jealous when I think of Mauritius you, and you being there, so I'm a little bit jealous of you. Uh, Chris has built multiple teams in, fin in the financial inclusion and agriculture development sectors across several African countries. Um, and it was during this uh, that he experienced the benefits of working with an executive coach who supported in improving his leadership skills. And this personal experience is what really inspired Chris uh, to do what he does today. So he um, is the founder of Coffee Chat which is a global digital platform that enables teams in emerging markets to offer affordable and relevant one-on-one -on -one coaching to more of their rising leaders. So Chris really took his um, personal experience uh, and used that as inspiration to create this opportunity uh, for the whole world really. And uh, fun fact, Tiffany and I actually met on Coffee Chat <laughs> just a few months ago and here we are. So. Um, Thank you, Chris. Definitely what you started, uh, uh, set out to do has um, this definitely created tip, uh, a positive impact for Tiffany and me. So thank you. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to Tiffany. Definitely agreed. So thank you for the opportunity for Coffee Chat. Love the platform. And actually I met one of our next week's guest uh, panelists as well on there. So Chris is, is the gift that keeps on giving and so is Coffee Chat, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I'd love to introduce Kim Menninger now. Kim and I actually met last year through um, a training that she was giving a talk. And I said, wow, she's just amazing. I really want to know her more. And so she does a lot around women and coaching women and women empowerment. And Kim's energy is just so amazing. She's just wonderful. And I'm very grateful that after having the opportunity to hear her speak, that I reached out personally. She's become a very fast friend and I couldn't think of anyone better to be on this panel to talk about this very subject because she really lives out these values. So as a women's leadership coach, Kim is passionate about empowering women to become more confident, visible and influential leaders. Having spent over 10 years in the high tech industry, she experienced firsthand the unique challenges and opportunities facing women in traditionally male dominated environments. She strives to be the best resource to women that she did not have during her own corporate career. Kim has a BA in psychology and an MBA from Boston College. She's an ICF Associated Certified Coach and CCE Board Certified Coach with certifications in career, executive, and leadership development coaching. 
And she also want, runs a fantastic women's group on Thursdays that I love and try to clear my calendar for too, to support women as well. So welcome, Kim. Welcome, Brian. Welcome, Chris. We are so excited for this panel. Before we do get started, if you could all, aside from our host here and our panelists, please, uh, if we can kindly request that you can switch off your video so that we only have our panelists on the screen and that they can see and interact with each other as well. Um, and then we'll turn it back on the option back on after Q&A. So with that being said, I'd love to kind of kick us off here on our panels, what we've all been waiting for, right? So um, if maybe we can start with why is mentorship important? Um, Chris, I'd love to uh, hand that one off to you. Yeah, um, how I approach mentorship is more in the framework of, or the broader framework of learning. Um, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the 70-20-10 model where 10% of learning is done in, in academic or classroom setting, 20% through mentorship and coaching, and then 70% learning by doing. Um, I learned about that when I was a country director of an NGO in Malawi, and I found that really helpful as a reminder almost on a daily basis of how you know people learn different, but, but uh, it's important to uh, include all of those things. And in a lot of companies, especially fast growing companies, uh, it's easy to put uh, the training and mentorship on, on the side burner and not uh, put enough emphasis on it. Um, but it's actually all really important to, to continue to build uh, a team. Um, and so that was in part uh, why I started Coffee Chat, which is a coaching platform, uh, but where people also find uh, mentors. But um, yeah, I think mentorship is just a part of of the learning process. So uh, it would be wise to not uh, leave that out. I love Chris that you that you describe it as a learning opportunity because I I'm sure many other people might agree that sometimes people I've had people come to me as looking for a mentor and so. What it's not, um, nor is coaching, is not just this, I'm going to dump a bunch of resources at you and you don't have to kind of grow or learn kind of on this continuum in the process. So really love the way you describe that as, as a learning opportunity because if we're seeking in mentorship, we really should be approaching it from a learning opportunity. Anything you'd add, Kim or Brian? Well, from my perspective, I often think about the work experience through the lens of confidence and the internal struggles that we often have as we're navigating what can be an intimidating environment, especially now when we're all working virtually, we don't have as much opportunity to connect at a, at a traditionally human level. Things feel a little bit more forced and we have to be more intentional about the connection. For me, mentorship has always been about not having to go it alone. I think there's a lot that we put on ourselves, especially as women, there's often that pressure to know everything, to do everything. Many of us are perfectionists. And when we can access mentors who maybe gone one or two steps ahead of us, who know the rope, so to speak, can help guide us, it just makes our own experience so much easier and it makes us feel so much more confident along the way. Yeah, agreed. Um. Okay, I'll pitch this one to Brian. <laughs> so Brian, what would you say that one should look for when they're seeking out a mentor? So thank you for that, Tiffany. Ooh. Can you hear me? Oh, we have you now. Okay, I've got to do it through my phone. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, so in terms of a mentor, looking for someone that's compatible with you, someone you can have a conversation with, someone that you want to spend time with, uh, someone that's a good listener, um, all are important because it's about building a relationship and connecting with someone. Um, and then also thinking about someone that can offer you a, uh, a different perspective, someone that can help you look at things differently. Um, and then also invite you into the space of solving your own problems, right? Not giving you the answers and throwing the resources at you as been brought up before, but someone that can kind of uh, either uh, connect you with resources or, or people that can help you move down the road of your career. And then this is all built on the element of trust, right? And building that trust where you can have um, vulnerable sometimes and um, authentic, genuine conversations 
so that, um, again, it's back to that relationship and that safety um, of having that uh, psychological safe space. Um, the other thing is, in terms of choosing mentors, there's different types of mentors that you want to have, right? So there might be a technical or functional mentor, which may be a shorter term relationship. There may be a longer term relationship. So the needs will be different. So it's really important to understand your needs as you're going to uh, enter into a mentoring relationship. And then for me too, I think having a shared agreement so you have a common understanding of what the expectations are of both is important in a mentoring relationship. So that's where I'd start with that. Thank you. Thank you. So much richness in there. I love the intentionality, the finding someone who maybe has a different skill set, knowing what your needs are in the in the beginning, the authenticity, and really love that you touched on vulnerability. And I've had the opportunity to share a clubhouse group with you uh, where you talk about vulnerability. And I think that's such an important piece um, that, that we really need. And we, we do have to allow ourselves to be a bit vulnerable in that position. Um, Kim, what are some of the top two to three challenges that you'd say that women face in finding mentors? I would say from an internal perspective, often we hold ourselves back. So it's a mindset issue. I know so many of the women that I work with and have worked with in my past, and I spent over 10 years in the high tech industry. So as you mentioned, Tiffany, I've experienced a lot of this firsthand is we tell ourselves a story that we're bothering people by reaching out, right? That we don't have anything to offer in return. And so why would somebody wanna spend time, take time out of their busy day to um, talk with us or to spend time with us? And so we don't even take the risk or take the initiative to reach out. The other challenge that I see a lot is that sometimes it's difficult to identify the, the commonalities or the, the access points to people who are at other levels of an organization or who may look different than we do. And so I've had um, women often tell me, especially women of color, I don't really know what we have in common, right? And so it feels a little bit awkward for me to reach out to this random guy that's maybe a few levels above me. And so we don't have, especially as I mentioned before, the organic opportunities often to connect with people. And so it keeps us from building the kinds of relationships that we're talking about. Yeah. What would you suggest or have you found like a best practice in terms of when there's maybe this hesitancy if, okay, I can't go ask my director, even if that person's not my direct boss. So do you have any, any suggestions for people to kind of share some of those commonalities or what would be kind of a good um, gateway to, to open up that conversation? I really love the idea of what I'm seeing more often. It doesn't seem to be something that's taken off in any kind of grand way yet, but I really love the idea of organizations sharing across the board some type of work with me document or some kind of background document that women can share that or everyone can share that says these are my interests talk to me about these topics right and it just humanizes the experience a little bit more because there are certain you know i guess in the workplace right maybe i can tell that you're a sports fan by the conversations that you have or what you have in your in your cubicle or workspace but it doesn't tell me some of the other aspects of who you are and what you care about that might be interesting to me. So the more that we can put that out there more visibly, the more access points we create for other people. I love that. Thank you. And I would say it's definitely not widely shared. I've not seen it in any organization I've been in and I've worked in all size organizations. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Chris, what are your two, two top recommendations on how to found, find mentors? Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot of it is, is just been touched on. I think some things to keep in mind uh, in my own experience um, would be around thinking of it not in, in terms of the traditional mentorship uh, framework, like the experience, I think, at least in my, my, in my mind, I imagine Oh, a mentor is like someone you meet and you're having a regular coffee with them and you, you know, end up, they, they end up being your mentor for years and years. And I think that can happen occasionally, but it's not always, you know, the storybook mentorship engagement. And so being comfortable with that, that maybe you just have one conversation with someone and they end up sharing great insights and advice. And that leads you along your journey and being okay that 
mentor or mentee relationships or conversations look very different uh, based on um, the, the time. And so um, I think that's one thing to keep in mind that not, not every mentor relationship will end up looking similar and being okay with that. And then also um, essentially having a different pool of mentors at any given time. Um, uh, I remember uh, at one company I had, I think five different mentors on a list and some of them were peers uh, who were a bit more experienced. Others were like global department heads in, in other areas. And I, list, I literally listed down, these are the two to three like topics that I'm going to you know, regularly pick their brain on. And, and I, I you know, spent a lot of time thinking about the types of questions and I would send those questions to them in advance of those mentorship conversations. Uh, so being really intentional and proactive and focused uh, about uh, who I was getting mentorship about what. Um, so I think those would be the, the, the main two things around how to, to find uh, mentors, or at least think about uh, going about it. Um, and both of those require an openness to just have a lot of like feeler kind of intro uh, conversations with a lot of people knowing that you might have a conversation with one person and it might not lead to anything, but um, that's just part of the process. I love what you shared. And I have found for me, that's been my experience. I had someone reach out during COVID and from Italy, I live in the US in Pittsburgh. And that person reached out and said, you work in HR, I really feel like you could help support me. And so I supported him all the way up till he got his job. I have one young lady who I mentor and we maybe talk every couple of months. And so it's gonna look different. I love that you talked about kind of this flexibility within. I really love that you touched on peers and how peers can become mentors to each other too. I think that's such a critical piece because often we look and we think, oh, that person has to be in a role that's that's higher than mine, or they can't be in my specific department, or it has to be my boss. So I love how we're kind of reshaping and redefining what that what that mentorship even means. Anything that you'd add on to that, Brian? Yes, thanks, Tiffany. I uh, love what Chris shared, a couple of things. Uh, when I was in corporate, uh, I helped develop a mentoring program for, for um, young professionals called Rising Leaders. And one of the executives there made the point specifically for women, and Chris talked about having different mentors, but having a, a female mentor because the work experience for women is different. And someone that's been through the journey can help you navigate that from the perspective of a woman. So that's important. And we keep hearing the theme throughout this conversation about building relationships first. So one of the things too, to remember when you're building a mentoring relationship or seeking that out is um, it's a, it's a two-way street, right? You're bringing value to the conversation too, or have that opportunity to, because you bring a fresh perspective if you're a new employee. You bring things to the table that will be valuable to your mentor. So don't think of it as a take, take, take thing. Think of it as a give and take and think in terms of, hey, what is this person potentially needing or ask them what they need and think about how you might serve them. That also builds a lot of trust and, and strengthens the relationship. So I just wanted to add that as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Also very, very, very important because where I've seen some of these mentoring relationships fail um, or not be as successful is when it becomes hey, I need you, or you haven't really like planned it out. And you have to approach it with the mindset that this is for you. You're going to invest time. They're going to invest time. And it's absolutely a two-way street. Thank you so much for sharing that, Brian. I think we've covered a lot of ground already. So I'd love to pause and see what questions people um, have. If you um, want to put it in the chat, if you want to um, share maybe off camera um, or on camera, I guess it would be, uh, please, um, I'm going to open up the floor for Q&A. Hey, Tiffany, okay. there was there was one question, which actually I responded to Portia. Her question was, can you explain, uh, define and explain the differences between mentor, ally, and sponsor? And I said, you read my mind, uh, our mind. That's a question that we have. So that's the only question I see in the chat. Okay. Um, but really, really great insights. Fantastic. Um, does anyone in particular want to take this one? 
or kick us off with the difference? Or do you, we can start with, you know, each of you can take one if you want as well, so. Maybe, um, Kim, do you wanna take mentorship? Sure. Sure, so when I think about mentorship, that's really, anyone can be a mentor and anyone can have a mentor. And really it's about getting that additional support, learning uh, somebody from somebody who maybe knows a little bit more than you do about something that you're trying to do, a pathway that you're going down, a topic that you wanna learn more about. A mentor is somebody that you can access pretty um, easily if you choose to do so, right? You can identify somebody and say, that's somebody that I'd love to learn from. That's somebody that I respect and admire and I'd like to connect with and take that initiative. Um, sponsorship's a little bit different than that. So I don't know if, if you want me to keep going or you want to pass that off to Brian or Chris want to talk about <laughs> sponsorship. <laughs> Does anyone have a particular um, passion for talking about sponsorship <laughs> or... <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, we can keep, have you continue and Brian and Chris, we can have you add in as well, if you're comfortable with that. I can talk about sponsorship. So I think the distinction, and this is one of the questions I think we uh, will be touching on is sponsorship is more about someone that's in a position to help you advance and influence um, outcomes on your behalf. So what I've kind of come up with as I was thinking about this is um, Sponsorship is ultimately the result of building a strong relationship and demonstrating consistent excellence that justifies the investment of time, effort, and reputational risk to support advancing your career. So that's sort of the definition around sponsorship that I've come up with. Wow. Wow. That's I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm reeling a little bit from that one, Brian. I thought, but I will say, um, not that I have full confidence that both Kim and, and Chris would have been able to um, share that in such a rich uh, conversation and definition, but I figured you specifically might have some thoughts on sponsorship. How about allyship? Chris, how would you define allyship? And, and or is there anything you'd add to mentorship and sponsorship? Um. To be honest, I don't have a, a comprehensive uh, definition of, of allyship, uh, maybe as I should. Um, it's actually a relatively new term. Um, it wasn't something that was actively used uh, when I was working at, at, last, uh, at the last few companies I've been at, and I've been a solopreneur for the past few years. Um, but it's my understanding that uh, having an ally is more someone who is seen as a peer, who's willing to kind of uh, validate different ideas that you have and be a cheerleader and, and kind of speak up with you on, on particular issues uh, in the workplace. Yeah, that advocacy piece, right? And and it could be in the workplace, it could be outside of the workplace. And I agree with you. I think that this one gets, um, it gets a lot of press in terms of what does it actually mean? Because it is very individual and it depends on where we are kind of on our, our individual journeys. It depends on what values and beliefs that we hold um, and, and what we see as, as important both in community and workplace. So thank you all for that. Let's see, are there any, oh, there are, there is a question. Hopefully I didn't miss the one before this, but I see there's a question on how do you suggest finding a mentor? I think we talked a little bit about this, so maybe we could add on to it. Um, how do you suggest finding a mentor? Anyone? I would okay. love to see you. On yes, yeah. I tried to wave, but my hand disappeared. <laughs> I, I, I would love to share two approaches that have worked really well for me. One is to be curious. And I am just a very nosy person. Uh, whenever somebody says something interesting or seems to be doing interesting work, I will always reach out and say, I wanna hear more. So when I was in my own corporate role, I would often just look around and see what people were doing. And I would reach out and say, I really liked what you had to say in that meeting or congratulations on get, getting promoted to that new role. Can you tell me more? And what I learned was that people love to talk about themselves. <laughs> And it really, if you show sincerity and you're respectful of other people's time, people really do like 
to feel like you care and are interested in what they're doing. If you think about it, how often do you get a chance to talk about what you do and what you care about with people who haven't already heard it or who really care? So that led me into some amazing relationships with people who on the spot said, I love your energy. I want to be your mentor or I want you to come and work on my team. What I also highly recommend is to be of service. So we all have opportunities within our everyday work to think about how does my work potentially impact or improve somebody else's job. And we most of us work in siloed environments. It's just the nature of business. So if you look at the work that's on your plate today and think about who else would benefit from knowing this, right? Is there another part of the organization that's maybe doing something similar, trying to recreate the wheel? Is there somebody else who might look at what you're doing from a slightly different angle and just reach out and say, hey, it occurred to me that we may have an opportunity to collaborate in some way around this. Would you be open to you know, brief conversation so we can explore it further? And it doesn't really matter what the outcome is, right? As, assuming that you're going in in good faith, what you've just done is you've created an opportunity for connection, an opportunity to educate somebody on what you do, on your value, and to you've shown people that you are being of service to them, right? That you care. And that that led me into relationship with a lot of other people as well. I love that. And it was that very energy that attracted me to you. And I said, I need to know Kim. Kim also has, uh, she also has a podcast. So, <laughs> um, okay. So I think that this might have answered, you might've answered part two of this question too. And I'd love to turn it over to Chris and Brian as well to add on, but anything special that um, you'd recommend approaching someone who you'd like to have as a mentor. So Kim, I think you kind of touched on some of that. Anything you'd add, Chris or Brian, to approaching someone? And I think we touched on that earlier too. Sure, Chris. Yeah, um, I would just add to the conversation um, a slightly different approach. So I think we've talked a lot about like the act of individually approaching someone uh, and then kind of essentially asking them to be um, uh, your mentor, uh, which is totally fine and can work in certain cases. Uh, there's also the strategy of reaching out to someone who you know has a lot of visibility across a lot of potential mentors. And I'm not talking uh, necessarily about someone like myself who runs a pool of, of mentors and coaches, but actually probably someone within your company who has been around for a while and knows a lot of people uh, at that level that you're thinking about uh, would be a good fit for, for mentorship. Because I remember being um, in those types of leadership roles and people would have like a, I'd have an open door and people would say, oh, I really wish I could get more support in this area. And because, you know, that nature of, of workplaces being siloed, they didn't know that, you know, X person over there would actually be a great fit. And so that person can, can kind of act as a matchmaker. Uh, and so it can be a fruitful conversation to talk to someone senior, not to seek out their mentorship, but just to explain to them, hey, I, I'd like to work on this area or get extra support in this area. And then they can introduce you to someone, uh, at least for an introductory chat to see if there's a good chemistry and, and that could lead to uh, a longer mentorship uh, relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Great advice, Chris. Um, there's another question in the chat, Brian, if you wouldn't mind taking this one that says, do you actually have to use the word mentor? Or can you just habitually run to X person with a certain type of question? Does that count as mentoring? What a great question. Yes, thank you for that. Can I respond to the prior question first and then take on the mentor yes, question? Yes, yes, absolutely. You, thank you. Take it away. So just something from my experience sort of that gets to what Kim and Chris were talking about to a certain extent is um, putting yourself in positions to interact with them. So if there's like for me, it was a um, like a task force, if you will, on culture and improving the culture, a volunteer effort where you're able to both interact with them and it demonstrates that you have curiosity around a similar topic. So that helps you build a relationship. So there's an intention about, hey, how, how would I like, what would I like to get involved in? What, what do they like to get involved in? The people that um, might have similar interest. And if you're part of a similar like uh, work team or a volunteer task force, you tend to interact then with people at different levels and then also with people of similar interest. So that's something I just wanted to add to what um, Kim and Chris are sharing because it's worked very well for me to build relationships and then 
network, as Chris was talking about, with people that have networks, and that opens up possibilities too. So in terms of using the word mentor, um, I don't believe you happen to necessarily use the term mentor. It's just, I, again, for me, before asking for anything like that, it's about building the relationship. So lead with curiosity, as Kim was talking about. Hey, I really like X in, term, uh, in terms of your experience. I was reading this article about you, or I listened to, uh, I was at your, um, your lunch and learn event. And I really appreciate this much. I just uh, wanted to you know, introduce myself, say I'm curious about this and um, was wondering if I might get you know, 15 minutes on your schedule. I have something specific that you know, would potentially um, help you because of the work I'm doing in my organization. So there's intention about it. You can, if you have the specific request for a mentor, I would um, build a relationship first before making that specific request because until there's a little bit of uh, what's in it for me and is there a fit in that, um, that uh, compatibility, um, the person may feel uncomfortable being asked on the spot to be your mentor without having some kind of runway to, to making that request. So I guess that's where I would respond to that. And if it's outside, let's see, a different question about outside the organization. So um, I don't think there's harm in doing, doing that, but I think you want to focus on building the relationship first in terms of using the word mentor or even any of the three things we're talking about. Can I add to that, Tiffany, too? Because I've never used the word mentor. I've never labeled the relationship unless it was a formal mentoring program. Mm. And I agree with Brian. And it's not just the, the risk on the part of the mentor to make that commitment too soon. You may not know enough about that person to know whether you want them as a mentor. And so there is that runway, like you said, that needs to happen before you decide, is this a person that I trust, that I value we share similar values so it's there's no need to slap a label on it and then it also puts a lot of unnecessary pressure on both of you when you have to ask that will you be my mentor question <laughs> yes i have a friend who says labels are for jars not people right so i think that you know i love what what you're sharing i love brian chris what you added on i love all the thought and questions in the chat this is this is awesome um Minachi, were you going to add yeah. something? Yeah, I just wanted to add. Uh, so uh, Pamela, first of all, thank you for sharing that. I think the worst that can happen, I totally agree with you. The worst that can happen is they'll say no. And, and mentors, you can find them outside of your organization as well. Thank you for sharing that. The other perspective that I wanted to add uh, from my own lived experience, uh, being someone, uh, uh, you know, I'm non-white uh, and English is not my first language. And I find that those elements, those intersections in my identity um, and my cultural background also in my experience has been uh, a barrier that I've had to overcome. Uh, so companies that I have worked for in my entire career have more often have been uh, the com companies that are headquartered in the West. And so the culture is different and I've had to overcome my own limiting beliefs around reaching out and seeking mentorship. Whether or not I called it men, a formal, you know, like labels, even if I didn't, but just reaching out for advice. And I think uh, it, what Kim shared in the beginning really resonated with me about, oh, I always uh, have a lot of self-doubt and I wonder if I'm wasting their time. If I am worth their time is the question that I've had to overcome. Um, and so if there's anyone here that, you know, shares that intersectional identity around language and culture, I wanted to call that out as well. Back to you, Tiffany. Thank you. I feel like we have like a fancy like <laughs> talk show going on or something right now. Um, there is an amazing question in here too um, that I'd love if each panelist could touch on briefly because I, I love this question. What was your richest experience as a mentee or as a mentor? Uh, we'll start with Brian. Thanks for that, Tiffany. So for me, it was um, coming out of this mentoring program that I helped create with a volunteer organization within the company I was um, working in. And I, I helped create it. So I had sort of creator's privilege in terms of who I could pick as a mentor. And I knew the person that was, that was leading the leadership, co the coaching practice within the organization, very small. I hadn't met him yet. And so I'm like, and I knew some, but I knew back to relationships, I knew somebody who knew him and I felt comfortable enough just selecting him without, you know, sight unseen for this mentoring program. And so in terms of the richness of it, I remember the first conversation, we start building relationships, you know, the relationship, it's, it's you know, going good. And he starts get, you know, asking me coach-like questions like, 
can, like, can he coach me kind of thing? Can he, can he bring stuff to the table? And, um, cause he was a coach and he saw things in me in terms of coaching capabilities and, um, sort of invited me into that space. And he was the reason why I ended up going into coaching and seeing that someone like me who had been a coach in sports on the field, kind of a leader on the field could bring that to the work situation, something I didn't see in myself. So he's directly responsible for me being here and doing what I'm doing now all from a mentoring relationship. And so um, in terms of richness, that's, that's the richest I, I can uh, think in terms of my experience. Thanks for the question. Yes, thanks for that very rich answer. Thank you. How about you, Chris? What would you share as um, a rich experience for a mentor or a mentee? Yeah, um, one of my mentors recently, um, though I've never called him that uh, officially, uh, he was a, well, he is a, an investor um, and uh, he was very clear up front that he was going to invest in my company. So I still took advantage of meeting with him every like six weeks or so uh, just for a regular coffee um, and we exchanged ideas. And one thing that I found really helpful in our conversations was that he always um, brought, he, it's not that he was playing devil's advocate, but that he introduced some kind of new framework to consider uh, my current like situation or challenge that I was reflecting on. Um, so also it's similar to coaching, but um, he would you know mention a, an experience that he had with another company he had invested in and how that worked out for that company. Um, and uh, would always kind of mention things from the investor um, hat that he was wearing. And so that was really uh, helpful for me because it was like a no pressure environment because I wasn't trying to pitch him for money, but he was explaining what he would, um, the types of questions and feedback he would give more honestly than he would if I were actually pitching him. So that was um, quite helpful. Wow, thank you for sharing that. And as an entrepreneur and a solopreneur, I can certainly appreciate that. We need, um, we all, everyone needs mentors, allies, and sponsors. And I, I love, you know, you sharing that story of how that impacted you. Kim, you're up. What was your rich experience? Well, it's funny, Brian, I felt like you were telling my story when you were talking about the task force, because I did that very early on in my corporate life. And it was a task force to address the issues that came up in the employee satisfaction survey. And I happened to connect with a man who was a lot older than me. Um, and he took me under his wing immediately. And we really hit it off. And he actually not long after that, served in, um, as a sponsor in some ways. He brought me onto his team. He did a lot of lobbying with his leadership to bring me onto the team because I was much more junior than the other members of the team. And what I really appreciated about him was his willingness to share how the political system worked. Like he would say, here's what you need to know before you step into this environment. I can still hear his voice in my head in terms of his take on things like so. So it was much more than just the surface level conversations that you might have. He, he had daughters too. And I feel like he just was really invested in developing women leaders. And he, he was at my wedding almost 10 years later. We only worked together for about two years, but he's still somebody who's part of my life today. And I'm really grateful for everything he did for me. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. I just, I love a good story, especially when it's a, a nice, powerful, inspirational story. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your questions in the chat and to our panel for, for sharing too. I do have more questions for our panel and feel free to toss your uh, questions for them in the chat as well as we move along. Um, so we'll kind of go into like part two, if you will. Um, so Kim, can you maybe, we talked a little bit about the difference between allies, mentors, and sponsors. What, can we dig a little bit deeper into sponsorship? What do you feel like effective sponsorship looks like? So Brian did a great job of defining sponsorship. And I think sponsorship is a little bit tricky because you can't go to somebody and say, will you be my sponsor? As Brian mentioned, that person has to be willing to invest their own political capital. It's a risk on their part. They have to trust that if they're going to advocate for you, if they're going to put their name on the line, that you're going to show up, right? And so there is, I think what's most important to sponsorship is visibility on our part. 
and our willingness to put ourselves out there and make sure that would-be sponsors have enough information to make that determination. And unfortunately, many of us as women have a little bit of discomfort when it comes to self-promotion, a little bit of discomfort when it comes to reaching out, as we've talked about already. And it's not sufficient to just keep our heads down and produce high quality work. We're not going to get the kind of sponsorship that we want and need if we're focusing on the work itself and neglecting all of the important connections and visibility opportunities that are, that are out there. So if you want sponsorship, if you want somebody who's going to advocate for you in that way, you really have to make an effort to put yourself out there and ensure that they know you well enough to take that risk. So true. Thank you, Kim. I want to, that's, that's very difficult. And I know you and I've had these conversations in terms of visibility and how do you, how do you access people? How do you get visibility? And you touched on that a little bit earlier too. So, so, so important to have that visibility. And I love that you shared the difference between um, how you in sponsorship, that person has to want that. And it's a different type of relationship. So, Brian, anything you'd add on to that in terms of how sponsorship comes about, um, how we can actively seek or look out for whom to sponsor? Yeah, so I love what Kim shared. And the thing that I would say is the intention. And so rather than going and requesting a sponsor, focus your energy on how you can be sponsorable, right? And so that's what Kim was talking about, but that's how I would think about it. How can I be sponsorable? How can I get the visibility? And it comes back to sort of that intention of if there are these volunteer task force things that are in an area that you have passion around that will put you around people with similar passions that may be able to get you access to people who you would want to meet in terms of relationships to help um, advance your career or just to connect and build relationships, um, with, find out people that you might resonate with in the organization. Um, that intention and putting yourself out there and it may be uncomfortable. So the other thing I would say is be comfortable being uncomfortable because guess what? That's like life and it's corporate life and it's a work life. And so um, you can just get more comfortable with that because that's going to be in service to you. And um, once you get through that discomfort or learn how to deal with it better, you'll see rewards on the other side as long as the intention is there, the effort is there and the, the energy of uh, recipro reciprocity, giving and leading with giving in terms of being a someone that's always, you know, can you help me do this? Can you help me do this? I think people are receptive to um, that relationship building up front and then that giving nature of how can I maybe help you doing what you're doing? Thank you, Brian. I, I especially love that you talk about leading uh, with giving and not just like, what can I get? What can I get? Because I think it was Kim who touched on earlier that we're wired. We like to talk about ourselves and we want to know, you know, what what's in it for me. Someone said that earlier uh, um, from the panel. And as humans, that's just how we're wired to say what's in it for me. I love also that you touched on being uncomfortable. I know for me personally, as an entrepreneur, as a solopreneur, this is the most uncomfortable I have ever sat, but I'm loving it because I have so many sponsors, mentors, and allies, and I'm growing in such different ways. So there's such a rich opportunity when we really embrace that uncomfortableness because there is growth that happens in that process. Chris, what would you add on to that? And do you think that sponsors have to come from within your organization? Um, I'm gonna share. Um, they, they definitely don't need to, especially if you're a solopreneur or a freelancer. Um, in terms of maybe people in your network who are trying to say, help you find clients or uh, get you in the right types of conversations. Uh, but if you are working with, with, within an organization that's small or large, uh, I think it depends. I think um, ultimately a sponsor is someone who can um, exert influence to, to kind of cheerlead you or give you access to opportunities. And so, I think sponsors can be both internal and external. I think a benefit of an external sponsor would be that perhaps they are seen by the internal influence influencer or decision maker as uh, above the fray. Um, so they can influence that decision maker and be seen as someone who maybe has a, a less biased perspective because they know you and they can speak to your skills or your potential uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily involve internal politics. Um, but obviously, if, if someone is an internal sponsor, they 
may have more influence. They may uh, know who, who else has uh, influence uh, uh, compared with someone who's outside the organization. So I think it really depends. And um, I think unfortunately or fortunately you do need to do like influencing, uh, influence mapping to some extent to really um, understand the bigger picture. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's impossible for someone at a junior level to really understand how decisions are made. Um, and that's, that's why it's important to have a sponsor that they can, or even a mentor that can help you fill, fill you in on, on how that uh, is playing out within your particular organization. Love that. Um, I think it's good that you brought up internal politics because we have to face that reality, right? That that is at play often. And so I, I like that you touched on that. Can you share with us? Uh, I've not heard the term influence mapping and I am getting a kind of a picture in my head, but can you share with us what that might look like, Chris? I, did, I, can, I just made it up now, but... Uh, <laughs> wow, I'm even more impressed now. But how I had it in my head was that, uh, I mean, there's certain types of positions that uh, may be similar in title, but maybe they're not in particular committees or at partner level. And so um, that, that definitely plays a role in someone's ability to effectively sponsor you. Um, so there might be, for example, two country directors, uh, but one of them is a general partner who actually has a vote in if that person is promoted, for example. Um, and so just understanding, um, is there some kind of like promotion voting procedure or is there some working committee where a decision is going to be made um, about where an opportunity is made or, or budgets are allocated um, that may not be um, readily apparent um, if, you, if you're just looking at an org chart or if you're just looking at uh, like a policy manual. So those are the types of things that depending on how um, mature or established the organization is, it might be something that you can go and read about. Uh, but if it's a fast moving organization or a younger organization, it's something that uh, you would need to kind of suss out through a couple different conversations with people who have been around uh, long enough to see um, how decisions are made informally. Okay. Wow, that's, thank you for giving me those golden nuggets, all of us those golden nuggets. I definitely, I'm a processor, so I'm, I'm soaking that all in as I, as I keep us moving here. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Kim, how do you feel like allyship plays into all of this? I know we've discussed that there are kind of, you know, maybe some different uh, definitions that people would share, but how would you say that allyship is a part of all this? So allyship is interesting because any one of us can be an ally, no matter where we sit in the organization. And it doesn't have to be a sought out relationship in some way, right? There, there's a little bit of a distinction there, but it's really important to everything that we're talking about. When I think about allyship, I think about it as, as an ally, I'm leveraging my privilege of whatever sort, right? Whatever political capital or privilege that I happen to have in support of others who may have less privilege or power than I do. And what's really important, I think from an ally perspective is that we not declare ourselves allies, uh, but that we really seek to understand the experience of others. If we want to be a source of allyship, if we want to be a source of support, we can't make that determination on our own. We need to really understand what does support look like to the people that we want to support. And I, I got an interesting call from a man about three or four months ago now that I really appreciated because what he said is, how do I show up as an ally? I'm really worried that if I don't do it properly, that I'm going to be perceived as condescending or swooping in in some way. I wanna be thoughtful about how I show up. And I think that's really important to this process too. If you wanna support others in advancing their careers and navigating the environments, you need to really understand from their perspective what those challenges are and how you can best support them. Wow, thank you for sharing that story too. Again, storytelling is powerful. We learned <laughs> that last week and um, this is, that's. I think that's so important. And there's been a lot of chatter around the fact that people shouldn't be calling themselves allies. It happens. And 
and there's maybe, you know, no harm, no foul. Maybe people are just, you know, they're wanting to support and they want to publicly demonstrate that they are allies. But I think what you share there, Kim, is that distinction of how can you leverage what privilege you have from the perspective of that person, what do they actually need? And that is the key distinguishing factor. So I love how you describe that. Brian, what would you add? So in terms of allyship, like in the workplace, right? So privilege comes in different forms, right? So if I've worked with Kim and I can speak to her abilities in certain areas on behalf of her with others, even if I'm her teammate or I'm her business customer, there's a way to be an ally to help uplift, uplift others no matter what role you're in, right? And so Kim and I have worked together for five years and she's uh, working with, now she's got a new role. She's working with a former business customer of mine. I could be her ally in terms of speaking to what I've experienced direct firsthand that mentors and, and sponsors may not have had the opportunity to do. So it's a different perspective to serve Kim um, from the, the lens of direct experience and say, you know what, she does this and this is how she um, re builds relationships with customers. This is how she, the impact she has and how she goes about her work that a mentor or a sponsor may not have that lens to, to share. So that's something I'd add. I love that. And if you actually let us beautifully into my next question, um, so maybe we can dig a little bit into this in terms of what, what allies bring specifically, what are maybe some of those, those things or the impacts, the outcomes that they can bring that sponsors and mentors maybe don't. And, and so it's modeling the um, collaboration and supporting one another rather than competition, right? So sometimes it's a, you know, Tiffany, you and I are competing for the same next promotion. So I can't really share what, I, you know, it's, it's kind of breaking that mold, right? In terms of how you're showing up on behalf of a colleague. Um, and so, and then also, hey, if someone's saying, who do you know who might be good at X, Y, or Z? And I've worked with Chris before. I say, you know, um, I don't know where Chris is in terms of where he's at with his role right now, but Chris or Portia or Suda, I know some folks that you should think about and kind of check in with them. And maybe there's an opportunity to work between managers and supervisors say, hey, we've got this project. We really could use Chris's skill set on this. Is there an opportunity for us to borrow him for, for three months, give him an opportunity to bring his contribution, create success for the individual, the team and the client and those kind of things too. It's getting the thing that allies can create opportunities to help us think differently about our resources as being um, siloed in their in their job in their what they've been hired to do in terms of job description and how they we can look at the whole person and bring the talents that they might bring and the experience they might bring to serve other needs in other areas. Love it. I know Brian we are advocates of the whole person, both of us. I know the whole panel is um and just why you're great and why we selected you. I, I love that. Chris, would you add anything to uh what Brian and, and Kim shared in terms of sponsorship, mentorship, how allyship um plays a part? If I understand uh properly what uh, an ally is particularly in the workplace, it sounds like you can have a lot more allies across the office at all the different levels compared with uh, at any given point, you might just have a handful of mentors uh, and maybe a few sponsors at once. So it sounds like you can almost activate uh, or have much more coverage through allyship. Would you agree? I would definitely agree with that. And because it could be anyone, right? And I think what you touched on earlier, Chris, in terms of kind of internal versus external, those politics at play, there's so much more opportunity, um, which I personally love because of the whole diversity, equity, inclusion piece and how that all folds in. You really can optimize your, your op opportunities through having allies and really through leveraging all three platforms in terms of ally sponsors and mentors. I think that was a great question. Um, Kim, what would you say that we would stand to lose when we don't have allies in our corner in our, our particular ecosystem? So there's, as we all know, a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of opportunity for change in the workplace. And a lot of us are doing grassroots level work in various employee resource groups and different initiatives. But without the political capital that comes from allyship, 
we aren't going to be able to make progress as quickly or as influentially as we otherwise could. And so we really need, and I, I think about this a lot, having such a focus on women's leadership and speaking to women's leadership groups and different corporations that without men, right, without people who are in positions of power, we're not going to get access to the resources. We're not going to be able to accelerate the pace of change. So we really have to all be in this together. And I think that just also going back to the distinction between an ally, a mentor, and a sponsor, an ally has the capacity to make our everyday experience better. Because when you're in a meeting and you can consistently get interrupted, the ally is there to say, hey, let's let her finish her thought, right? Or the ally is there to call out bad behavior um, by others. And so those are roles that we can all play and micro, in micro environments and micro interactions in every day uh, of our work. And that just creates a more inclusive culture for everybody. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Cam. And I think that well, and, and the main reason I, I like that so much is, is because I'm huge on inclusivity and within culture work, like it's so important. People sometimes make it um, harder than maybe it needs to be because we think we have to pour all these things into it. And yes, it is work and by design, it should be work. But at the same time, it's basic everyday things. You notice someone, and now, of course, you know, many of us are in this remote environment, but it's noticing when someone does put their hand up on Zoom or if they take off their microphone or they look like they're, they have something to say, we can still read body language. There's so many things we can do. And I love that you touched on everyday interactions, those micro interactions and, and those things add up, they add up to the larger impact. So thank you so much for sharing that. And you touched on, I love how you all just beautifully make my job easier here. Um, you touched on needing men as, as allies. So Brian, how, do, how, do, how can women kind of engage their allies or, or how can men show up as allies for women? So in terms of men showing up as allies for women, I think it's as a, just even taking it from a human perspective, um, it's paying it forward. And if, you know, lifting a hand to help someone come up in terms of um, the micro, as Kim was talking about, saying something when something needs to be said. And if you're in the room and you, you let something happen, that means you're tolerating the behavior instead of disrupting the behavior. And so it's, uh, it's sort of like, say, see something, say something, right? And we can do that respectfully, right? It's not about causing a, you know, uh, unnecessarily a big explosion to happen, but it's saying something when there's something to be said. And so from the micro level, on a macro level, it's realizing that privilege creates responsibility and opportunity. And so from a place of privilege, if you're someone with privilege, then how are you using that responsibility? And how might you use it more expansively than you have been using it and being intentional about that? And so um, if we realize that whether it's women or different uh, groups of humans are struggling with getting access to things, well, then how can you be a leader in that, right? And so it's that intention, that, um, that um, big picture view of, you know, in order for us to, to uh, address our business goals and in order for us to become better as an organization, as a team, as individuals, we've got to step up and help one another because we're better together. And if we don't create the, and lead with those behaviors that create that environment, um, then we're still part of the problem. Thank you for sharing. I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I like that you said we're better together. I say all the time together is better because when you really think about it, what what can we really get done by ourselves? Even as solopreneurs, there's you still need people. You have to find your drive and you have to find people who are there to help support you along the way. What thoughts do you have on that, Chris, in terms of uh, men and women engaging in, in, in an allyship? Um, I would add uh, that executive coaching actually can play a role in this. I think a lot of senior leaders uh, in positions of power and, and privilege um, can use executive coaching to help identify blind spots that include things like, oh, wow, people need to be intentional of in finding allies, mentors, and sponsors, because they may not have had to do that intentionally to get where they were. So I think, uh, executive coaching can, um, 
be really important for uh, senior leaders to go through, um, you know, in addition just to being better leaders themselves, they can, as a part of that process, that, that can help them uh, be more self-aware of uh, those types of tools that their own teams are using to uh, grow their careers. Thank you for adding that, Chris. What a great ad. I think, you know, sometimes it, it's well first it's important to be self-aware but sometimes we don't always know what those those blind spots are so we need others such as an executive coach to help us see kind of around those corners um i have one final question which will span the panel um if you could all just share if there's what hasn't come up yet in the conversation that you would love to add and then i'd, I'd love to open it up for a general q a um yeah, let's start with you. Okay, and can I just say one thing on the other question too about the al women uh, working with allies? I just want to note that that effective allyship requires mutual vulnerability, and that's not an easy thing to do in the workplace. There are a lot of well-intentioned men, as I mentioned, to the one who called me, who want to be allies and are afraid of getting it wrong. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're afraid of being presumptuous. They're not really sure how to have that conversation. And a lot of women who don't know who to trust. And so there has to be a little bit of give and take on both sides before we can realize who we can truly trust. And so to really be on the lookout for who are the people, who are the men that consistently show up as the ones who get involved in those micro interactions, right? The ones who seem to be really standing up and, those are people that you can trust for the most part, you know, you may need a little bit more information, but you can trust to go to, to say, hey, I'm experiencing this challenge. Would you be willing to, in this situation, step in or um, show up in a certain way? Uh, so I think it requires that we both work towards that um, and not just rely on the allies. <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. Um, what I will say to in terms of things that haven't been said today, one thing I was thinking about was sponsorship because we talked about the fact that we can't say, um, will you be my sponsor, is to really be clear about what your goals are and to be willing to share them broadly with other people. Because a lot of times people don't know what we want and would be sponsors aren't necessarily sure what we're interested in or how they could support us. So it's really important to be out there sharing what are my short and long-term goals, what would help look like for me so that sponsors can get more in actively involved in helping you to get there. And one thing I will say is that there's often what we call benevolent sexism, right? So people are making the decision for you saying, well, she's at home, she's homeschooling right now. She's probably too busy for a promotion or she probably doesn't wanna travel because she's got a two year old. So you don't want someone else making those choices for you. Right? So you have to be out there being very proactive about the message of what you do want. Thank you, Kim. Absolutely agree. Brian, what, what haven't we touched on that you'd love to add here? Thank you, Tiffany. I'd like to just come back to sponsorship and add a distinction. And so it's the notion of voice at the table versus influence at the table. And so with sponsorship, you're looking for influence at the table. And that requires all the things you've talked about, Chris and Kim have shared in terms of putting your voice out there, letting people know, building those relationships and um, having intention, giving value. All those things are necessary. But what we want to do as we're kind of, if you're really looking to get into a situation where you're sponsorable, you want to kind of navigate a path that you're looking for someone that who has influence at the table. So that requires you having a noticing muscle and awareness to kind of have the radar for who those people are. Thanks, Brian. Absolutely agree. Chris, round us out. Bring us home for the home run. Yeah, so one thing I touched on earlier, we touched on earlier around having external versus internal uh, sponsors. And I would just elaborate on that, um, you know, looking, at allies, mentors, and sponsors is to actually be intentional about having both. Um, because if you're working with a company and you, you know, are fully invested and you see yourself growing with that company, that's great, but you still want to kind of diversify to have mentors and sponsors outside of the company as well, in case you do want to eventually transition out or something happens where you do need to transition out quickly. Um, in my own experience, 
I benefited greatly from having a sponsor who was outside the organization. So uh, when I was working and I decided that I did want to make a move, I was able to do that uh, quite smoothly in a short amount of time. Um, so I think some people get trapped because they build so much uh, social capital um, and they do it quite well, but they do it all within their company. And so they feel a bit trapped. Um, so it's great to give yourself that optionality and build uh, a mentorship pool and, and identify sponsors outside of your organization as well. Thanks, Chris. I, I love that. I'm, I have a huge passion for removing toxicity and helping people get unstuck. And so I love, I never want anyone to feel stuck. So love that you, you call that out too. Thank you all. I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Um, if you do have them, please feel free to put them in there. You can come off mute if you'd like. I'm going to pause here. Um, otherwise, I'll hand it back over to back to you and actually. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I tried, th this was just phenomenal uh, discussion. I, I don't think uh, we could have asked for a better group to come together to talk about this important topic. So thank you uh, very much for doing this for us, Kim, Brian, and Chris, uh, really, really grateful. And all of your insights, absolutely wonderful. I, I tried my best to kind of capture it in the notes uh, in the chat for everyone to take back as well. Um, what really emerged for me was the themes that emerged are one is self-awareness, knowing what we uh, as individuals are looking for when we seek mentors, sponsors, or allies, or all three of them or one of them, whichever, whatever is, it is that we're seeking, being clear in our own minds about our goal and purpose. That really emerged in everything that all of you shared. The second piece, Closely associated with self-awareness, what, what came up for me was courage. Uh, once you know what you want, going after it, having the courage to go after it. And the third thing that, a theme that emerged was um, inclusion. Um, and Tiffany and I, you know, we've chatted about this and that's one of the reasons we uh, feel so closely aligned. Our brands, our what business, what we do, is, one of our core values is inclusion. And, and I always say that, uh, you know, and I put it in the chat as well, that the future of work belongs to everyone. The future belongs to everyone, not just work. And so everyone needs to be included in, in co-creating it. So this whole thing around building diversity within our own, um, one of my other mentors uh, talks about it as a personal board of directors. Uh, and, uh, you know, what a, what a great metaphor. And I think, uh, Chris, I, I know that one of the things that you highlighted was having that diversity in your personal board of directors. I, I thought that was a great call out. A lot of wonderful uh, comments from our um, audience here. Really, really uh, appreciate everyone's in, uh, engagement. There was one question that I captured uh, and I wanna bring it back up. Uh, give me one second. I, I've copied it here. Thank you for catching that too. In the spirit yes. of inclusivity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it was Candence. Uh, her question was, is there any advice on how to start a mentoring program at location? How to start a mentoring program at location? So I can speak to that. Um, what we did back uh, when we were doing the mentoring program with Rising Leaders is we partnered with HR who already had a, a, a list of best practices and helped us create mentor and mentee like guides, right? What is, my, what is the role and what are the different things um, that uh, are involved with each of the roles such as the, the mentee initiates the meeting invite, that kind of thing. And all the way to um, how you, what are the expectations for the, the uh, relationship there? The other thing from experience that I would um, advise against is doing a matching system just based on limited information. Uh, it doesn't work uh, effectively. It's got to be a cultivated relationship in my mind where there's intention, there's mutual agreement as to um, uh, the willingness to uh, invest the time and, um, and energy and um, and to define it. And as you know, Chris was mentioning too, mentorship shows up in different ways. So there's the organic nature of it that Chris is talking about. But if you're gonna do a formal program within an organization, I would um, 
seek guidance from HR or other people that may have created programs internally and in either in your organization or at other organizations. That's the beauty of, you know, we talk about internal and external sponsors. People come from everywhere, right? So we've, that's back to the holistic person is who, you know, do you, might you know that has created a program elsewhere? What did they do? And this notion of sharing information, I think maybe that's an opportunity for us all to get better at sharing information and getting curious about, hey, this new person came to the company, what is their background? Because they might bring a wealth of things that their job title and their role doesn't necessarily tell you. So the first thing I would say is um, kind of maybe tap into the expertise that may exist in the organization. Um, what is it that you want to get out of the, the program? Like, is it just within, say, technology, for instance, you're creating a mentoring program? Is it, you know, um, for women? Is it for uh, people of color? What is the, the intent of it? And um, who are the resources that you might need to help you with that? Is someone to organize it? Someone to um, lead it? Is it, you know, we just, I think we had a committee of folks that was a combination of people from this Rising Leaders Volunteer Organization, HR, um, stakeholders, and we had regular meetings to kind of cultivate what it would look like because we built it from scratch with some best practices laced into it. So that's the experience I can share from my situation. Very rich that's one indeed. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank Very you, Brian. Good. Looks uh, like Pamela can help you too, if anybody <laughs> Pamela yes, has done yes. this as well. I just, I just saw that. And, uh, you know, I'll just add my two cents here. I've been on both sides of a formal ment mentorship program. I've been the mentor, I've been the mentee. Um, and I'm happy to chat with Candace with you offline if you'd like any pointers. And of course, there's Pamela out here. Um, any quick 30 second additions from Kim and Chris? I will just say that to Brian's point, there's no substitute for the organic mentorship that rises between two people who've connected. And so formal programs have their place, but I, even if you have a formal mentor, don't use the formal mentor as a um, you know, substitute for all of the other relationships that are out there. Absolutely, I, mm -hmm. I agree. And before I go to you, Chris, I, I'm noticing that people are uh, dropping off. I just wanna do one call out. Uh, there is time change here in the US tomorrow. So uh, the rest of the two sessions will be one hour earlier for everyone else in the world because it's 8 a.m. Our sessions are all 8 a.m. Uh, but if you're joining us from anywhere outside of the United States, uh, it's gonna be one hour earlier. Just for to make that call out before uh, people dropped off. So we hope to see you all back. It'll be one hour earlier. Uh, thank you for allowing me the, to do that, Chris. Um, uh, your, your inputs. Uh, the only thing I would add related to the, the mentorship program design, um, if it's anything like coach matching, which I've done with a few organizations, it's uh, best to let uh, people um, pick uh, their their mentor. Obviously, there's some limitations to, to that. You don't want to overload someone with too many uh, mentees. But um, what we do with coach matching is you get essentially uh, selected three options and you can have intro chats with them and then you get to pick one out of that so I, I suppose you could apply that same dynamic um, so that ultimately the mentee feels like they have some agency to pick and that there was an opportunity to see which one had been a better chemistry. I totally second that, Chris. And uh, the mentorship program that I was in had that system set up. So you do like a chemistry call with your potential mentor, and then you figure out if it's a, if it's going to if it's a good match. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for calling that out. Um, I know we're at time. I'm just going to take two more minutes. I cannot thank this panel enough. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us and making this so valuable for uh, for us and our attendees. Uh, just a quick couple of call outs. Um, So this was something uh, when we were doing some digging and reading, this was another uh, distinction between a mentor and a sponsor that really spoke to us. Mentors help you skill up while sponsors help you move up. Um, and to me, allies fit in in, in the space uh, just uh, seamlessly. And this, uh, uh, I wanted to call, you know, use this quote as inspiration uh, in the context of allyship. The world suffers a lot, not because of the violence of bad people, but because of the silence of good people. 
And I think that's where allyship plays such a huge role. And like all our panelists pointed out, there are, uh, you don't have to wait for that big gesture. There is enough opportunities in our everyday lives to show up as uh, sponsors, mentors, and allies. And that's one of our big takeaways from today's discussion. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, Sarah Blakely, the founder and CEO of Spanx, uh, if you don't follow her on LinkedIn, I think you should. Uh, she comes out with this Monday morning inspiration uh, mugshot, as she calls it. Uh, this one really spoke to me. And um, I don't know if Divya Sriram is still on the call, um, but but Divya, this is one of the uh, visuals that you did uh, that you know you you have to look back to look to move forward and that's what came to mind when I saw this this Monday mm -hmm. an arrow can only be shot by pulling it backward and so when life is dragging you back with difficulties it means that it is going to launch you into something great and that's our hope for all of us as we close out today's session and we really look forward to seeing you on the 20th next Saturday. And as I said, it's going to be an hour earlier everywhere else in the world. It's still going to be 8 a.m. for us. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you then. And uh, we're going to have another panel discussion. Uh, and the topic is women in leadership, achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. And we have another wonderful globally diverse, geographically diverse panel joining us, um, Akua, Jay, Jamal, and Sudha. So we hope to see you back here next week. Thank you all. Yes, thank you very much. And that's all we've got for today. And thank you for sparing us the additional two minutes. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if I may request the panelists to just hang on for a few more minutes, we'd lo just love to do a quick debrief with you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we will see you back here next week. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.